Welcome everybody to The Pulse, where you are always up to date with the latest, greatest health and fitness information. I am your host, Carol Ann, your fitness expert, or as I like to call myself, aka your closet couch potato, because yes, you know, I really like to hang out on the couch too. We've got a lot of people out there that like to chill in front of the TV, and we like to veg every now and again, but we're not supposed to as fitness professionals, but I'm here to say that I am just like you dealing with all the health and fitness struggles that we all deal with. So we're here together to get through this thing together, through this journey of health and fitness through life, that we can have a healthy, healthy lifestyle and that we can have not only the quantity of years of our life, but also to have a high quality of life. So gang, today the show is exploding with health and fitness. We have an amazing guest today, yoga expert and hypnotherapist, Gwen Hanna. And wait till you hear what she has to share with us today. I always find this super interesting. And as we were talking earlier before the show started today, you know, as a fitness, health and fitness expert, I am, you know, really leaning more on the scientific side of things and, you know, studies and backing everything up with data. But, you know, I am fascinated with uh, the other aspect of kind of, you know, Eastern culture type of health and fitness. And, uh, and as Gwen was saying, you know, the metaphysics of health and fitness. So this is going to be truly inspirational to get to hear what she does and, and what programs she has to offer for people out there. So stay tight for that. And in addition, we have What's Trending Today. And this is the latest in the health and fitness industry so that you can stay on top of the latest information, the studies that are coming out, so that you truly know what will get you the best results as you're on your journey. So uh, we will get in with that. And we've got all the latest hot hot topics. So stay tuned. You don't want to miss any of it. So don't go anywhere. But first, we have a hydrate alert for everyone. So during every show, we play a game called Guzzle for Your Muzzle. So we all know that, you know, before you do your workout, your pre-workout, and even your post-workout, it's always great to have uh, a nutritional drink like a protein shake or something that will get you prepared for your workout and then also recovery from your workout. So we talk a lot about that. Also, throughout the day, you really want to remain hydrated with water, at least 64 ounces of water every day. And then this also depends on your weight as well and how active you are. So always keep on hand water. And every time you think about it, take about 10 seconds and do what I call the 10 second chug. So get in as much water as you can when you think about it. But today, what we have on hand is this awesome Evolve Thin Drink. Now, our guest, Gwen, she's going to be sharing this drink with me today. So every time we say the word of the day, and the word of the day is relaxation, I have a feeling we're going to be using this word today. So every time you hear that word throughout our show, take a sip of your drink, whether if it's water or protein or even this fabulous Evolve Thin drink. Let me tell you a little bit about this drink. This has an, uh, a natural kind of like a light carbonated carbonated taste to this drink. And this is a great drink if you're reaching for something in the afternoon for a healthy snack. This is a great substitute for those monster drinks out there, the Red Bulls, the the not so healthy energy drink for us. This has a, an all natural shot of bougre in this, which is, um, it's an energy booster. It also is an appetite suppressant. So this is a great alternative for the afternoon. So if you want more information on how to get this, you can always Facebook me at Carol Ann Miss Fit. That is my Facebook handle. So you can always look me up Facebook message me, and then I'll tell you where you can get that. So remember the word of the day, relaxation. All right, gang, so don't hate, rehydrate. Next, we have our fabulous guest here today, and we've got plenty of time that we're going to be dedicating to her because she has so much to offer us. And and this information is so broad and inspirational and just enlightening us to, to think broader in terms of our health and wellness. And Gwen, she is a hypnotherapist. She's also a yogurt. I was going to say yogurt. <laughs> you know what's on my mind. Yoga expert. And, um, you know, 
you've got so many, uh, you know, titles behind your name and so much education. And so first, you know, tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us how you got into where you are. I mean, a lot of people, they start off on their path. For me, for example, I started off thinking I was going to get into the fashion merchandising industry. So I went to school, got a degree in fashion merchandising and business was my background, uh, you know, my undergraduate degree. And then I had a major shift. It didn't take me long to make that major shift change for all, you know, for being a health and fitness expert. So, you know, tell us about your path and how you got into this industry. Well, um, ever since I was a child, people always talk to me about their problems. Uh huh. So um, it was sort of a natural progression. Um, I am a good listener, apparently, and um, I always knew, really, by about the time I was fourteen, that I would become a, a counselor. I wanted to be a psychologist. So I uh, went to school, and I ended up. Um, I really hated the field of psychology, actually, mm. as far as formal training. Mm -hmm. So I got my undergraduate degree in sociology. <clears throat> and um, then I went on to rehabilitation counseling, and I was very fascinated in working with people who had physical injuries. Okay. Um, I can also do the standard drug and alcohol rehabilitation stuff, and I, I do that in hypnotherapy as well. But my primary interest really was working with people with injuries and chronic illnesses. Mm -hmm. um, so I did that uh, for a little while, and then I went ahead and became a, a mental health counselor in private practice. So I've been in private practice since 1990. Okay. So when you when you talk about, you know, let's focus on the, um, the therapy aspect when they're injured in that. Now, are we talking like people who are injured and they have little mobility and maybe the depression sets in? Or when you're talking about psychology of it, tell us a little bit about that. What, is, what does that mean exactly? Well, the field of re rehabilitation counseling in that regard it has to do with the whole person and their family. So um, most of the time, the people I were working, I was working with anyway, were injured on the job. So I did a, a type of vocational rehabilitation. And um, I would not only would counsel them through the emotional um, difficulty or the, the emotional changes that they were going through with the variety of injuries, and they could be, uh, most of them were back injuries, but some of them were loss of limb. Yeah. Um, and most of them involved loss of their occupation. Mm. So there was a lot of grieving, uh, and within the family there was a loss of finances. Mm. And also there could ha also be a, a, a variety of loss of function. And in one case I was working with, was their injury was low on the spinal column and it was a loss of sexual functioning. Mm. So there's uh, also counseling with the family on how to adjust to the injury, how to adjust um, not only um, financially, but emotionally and um, within their relationship. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so the, um, the aspect of, of that was really very interesting, and they would put me on the hardest cases. Because you were so good. Because you're so good. <laughs> Apparently I was. <laughs> and I bet you that's pretty hard for you. I mean, how do you go from absorbing all of that energy from people because you know everything flows from high to low and you know really that must you have to be a really strong individual to be able to take on a lot of that and to really i mean that must be really amazing for you to be able to help people and then maybe that was offset by the joy that you got from helping them well we're trained to do how to manage that stress on mm -hmm. our jobs. In fact, I'm doing a, a workshop this weekend on compassion fatigue with a friend of mine who's a psychologist, Diego Hernandez, uh, at Springfield College in Brandon. <clears throat> That's, uh, but it's something that we're trained in, and it's not, people do think initially that you have to be very strong to take it on, mm. but no, what you do is you let it pass through you. So mm. you, you actually don't have to take on people's stuff. Um, we're just um, professionals, and we create what, you, you know, you have a professional distance when you work with your, your yoga students or your fitness students. And so we don't take on their stuff. I mean, it's, it's if you over-empathize, mm -hmm. and if you're not taking care of yourself, um, say, working out, eating correctly, hydrating correctly, managing your stress, 
then you those there's several of us um, that may have a tendency to take on people's problems. You, we've all heard it. You know, you take it home, you worry about it, you fret about it. But I've gotten better and better and better and better about that over the years. <laughs> and and uh, I also am a Buddhist, so I also recognize that it's not my karma. Right. I can have compassion, and I can have caring, uh, and I can have expertise in helping my clients, but I don't have to take on their karma or their stuff. Mm. It's actually their journey. Nice. So I'm just sort of facilitating a little bit to help them find their own way. So you go from doing <clears throat> basically your your therapy in that direction, and then we have a then I feel that we've moved on to after that you became I became a licensed mental health counselor into okay. private practice. Um, I really like working in private practice, and um, that was in 1990. So what was that? 22 years ago, and then about 18 years ago or something like that, I became a, also a hypnotherapist at that time. So I've been doing both of those for a very long period of time. And six years ago, to, or yeah, 2006, I got some very specialized training in heart-centered hypnotherapy, which is regression hypnotherapy. Um, a lot of metaphysical individuals might think that I do uh, regression in the sense of past life, which I can do, I'm trained to do, but that is really not my primary focus. I regress people to their childhood. Mm. Um, times and help them find the source of the issue. So an ideal client for me could be a brand new client to therapy, but it could also be a, an individual who's had some previous therapy, such as cognitive behavioral therapy, mm -hmm. which is a, a form of behavioral training. You learn skills, mm -hmm. how to communicate better, how to manage your stress, how to manage um, assertiveness, how to communicate but they may, and they may have made some progress, but they may have not gotten through or gotten over that hump of why am I still getting triggered with this type of person? Why am I still getting into these same kinds of relationships? Um, I've had people come in who have uh, high paid professions and they have a new manager, a new supervisor on the job, and all of a sudden they're getting triggered by this person. Mm -hmm. They're feeling nervous or angry, uh, have a lot of anxiety. They feel confronted, and they want to quit. These, these people come to me. We do one or two sessions, and they're done. Really? I'd also do, yes, really. Wow. Wow. Because I know a lot of people that are triggered yes. by their boss. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. So one to two sessions, and you're done. You're you're in most wow. cases. In most cases, my average is one to two sessions. They're two hours long. I do a one hour intake. So I'm a, I'm a mental health counselor, and this is hypnotherapy. So I do a one hour intake. So I learn about them. Mm -hmm. I learn about you know who they are, their past experiences. I learn about their family, their family history. If we have time in that first hour. And then I learn about what are the strong emotional feelings that keep coming up for them mm -hmm. that we're going to be working on. These sessions are very highly customized. Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly saying, okay, let's look at what do you want to do? And then we kind of assess really, is this the real issue or is it something that's an offshoot of that? Or is there something even deeper than that? And they probably, they don't even know what it is, right? Sometimes they do. I mean, oh, they do. Oftentimes they do kind of the way I advertise myself. I'm saying my ideal client is somebody that's had some therapy, but maybe hasn't actually really gotten to the root of, you know, why do I keep kicking walls in when I get angry? Mm -hmm. You know, why do I keep um, getting alcoholics or addicts in my life and, or people who are not available? Mm -hmm. as relationship partners in some fashion or another. We're not emotionally available or, you know, the, right. light, the lights are on but nobody's home. Right. Kind of I mean, I have a lot of girlfriends that go through Absol that. Absolutely. Yeah. We all do. <laughs> yeah. like that. I've had my own versions. Oh, of yeah. <laughs> so, um, so tell me, because you... You've got a lot of education to to help us understand in terms of, for example, one one question that I know that you that you address is what is the difference between hypnosis, hypnotherapy, and heart centered hypnotherapy. So let's talk about that. So what is the difference? Absolutely, and it's a, it's a good question. Hypnosis is simply a natural state of trance, and that, but it's a voluntarily induced one if it's called hypnosis. Most of us um, have um, 
daydreamed, all right? Mm -hmm. That's a form of naturally occurring trance state. Okay. If you've ever driven home and you've been so engaged in thought that you haven't seen the last couple stop signs and stop lights, mm -hmm. so when you turn in your driveway and you go, oh my goodness. We've all done this. How did I do that? That's a naturally occurring trance state. Um, so hypnotists um, are people who um, know that and who induce hypnosis, but you can't hypnotize anybody to do anything that they don't want to do or they wouldn't normally do. So, example, for example, a hyp hypnotic stage show. Right. I was going to ask you about that. So tell me about that. So you're probably sitting out in the audience probably critiquing everything. So talk about that. <laughs> Well, generally, they're going to have some sort of introduction to the audience. They're going to either have a written piece of paper or they're going to have an introduction before, you know, for the studio audience before the hypnotist comes on. And they're going to say, hypnotist is going to come on tonight. They may pick a few of you out of the, the audience and you may be asked to cluck like a chicken, um, take your jacket off, stand on one leg, um, fall asleep. And people are going to be nodding. And there's some people that are going to be saying, well, I could do that. But nonetheless, what's happening is that is called a pre-hypnotic suggestion. Hmm. So they're already engaged in thinking about or perhaps visualizing or think, you know, seeing themselves as maybe doing that. So they call them up there and they do, their, they do an induction. The induction is real. It helps people to relax. Okay, everybody, take your drink. <laughs> <laughs> it's a form of the word. <laughs> um, and so they are um, more suggestible, but they've already been set up with this pre-hypnotic suggestion. So they will do it. If they're not going to do it, they probably are not going to be engaged in wanting to go up there. They're not going to volunteer to go up there. Okay. You know, if somebody's dead set against clucking like a chicken, I probably have trouble with that. So hypnosis is really a form of voluntary induced um, trance state. Now, um, hypnotherapy is we're doing therapy. Okay. So they've um, already decided to come see me. So they're already engaged in the idea that they would like to be hypnotized for therapy or to get over something. One of the most common forms of hypnotherapy, even though that's hypnosis as well, is uh, smoking cessation. Yes, talk about that. We have a lot of people that are really struggling with, you know, with their addiction of smoking. And so, but you hear so many success stories about the hypnotherapy for smoking cessation. So let's, let's go there. Talk about that. Tell us how that would happen, how that session happens. Well, that in fact is one of the reasons why I was interested in hypnosis because I uh, quit smoking through self-hypnosis in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. So it's a matter of suggestion. It's a matter of relaxing. It's a matter of breathing. And then it's a matter of bringing in positive suggestions. Now, the subconscious mind is theorized in with hypnotherapy is to be literal. The, su the subconscious mind wants our words, not someone else's. So when a client comes to see me, I will say to them, we want to say, we want to talk about this concept of smoke, uh, smoking cessation in a positive format. So I want to hear some of your words about how, how will you improve? What will be better in your life? And those are amazing questions to ask mm. people because sometimes I get grandmothers or grandfathers and they'll say, I want to be alive to hang out with my grandkids. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I want to smell better. <laughs> yes. I want to actually save some money. Mm -hmm. I want to live longer. So um, I'll write those words down verbatim. And then uh, we'll ha I'll have uh, several suggestions. And prior to that, you know, I will have talked to them about their motives. What is there any reason why you wouldn't want to quit smoking? Sometimes people ha may have a reason. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they might say, well, I'm not sure I can. I love the taste of cigarettes, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. And so we'll have to work on that and really do a customization about, uh, sometimes I can actually work with them to, to make it taste bad, oh. to make it actually make them sick if they want it. So what, do you have like a word association with that or how does that work? If the, we were doing something like that, um, I would say, um, imagine 
the most nasty thing you can possibly imagine. Just ugh, mm. imagine it and put it out, put it in your right hand. Think about it. It's, it smells disgusting and makes you want to vomit. It's, ugh, it's horrible. It's the Ooh. most disgusting thing. Put it in your right hand, hold it there. Take your cigarettes in the other hand and mash them right into it. Mm. So you've got sort of a blending of something nauseous or something ah. um, foul or disgusting. So that's a concept. Now, I don't really do that unless they want me to. I'll mm -hmm. tell them. Sometimes people want that. They, they say, I feel like I really need yeah. that. Is that like the extreme, extreme, like that will be? And what's the, what's the, how many sessions do they need with you? For a smoking cessation, if they are motivated, um, we can't find any reason why they shouldn't quit. Um, and they, they're, there's other things as a therapist, I think, that people need to do to quit smoking. I don't think that hypnosis for smoking cessation is the, the end all solution. I think they need to uh, look at um, times of smoking. They need to look at food. They need to look at hydration. They need to look at detox aspects of it. And actually, the American Cancer Society, the, the American Lung Association, they have free handouts for yes. stuff. And I'm all about free. So it's like if you go get that and you get the behavioral program associated with that, you start working on it, we can use hypnosis as an adjunct. But I'm not going to sell it to you as an end-all, be-all. Okay. Some hypno hypnotists might not like that, but that's just my feeling. Now, hip heart-centered hypnotherapy is um, the kind of training that I got, um, and I got that in Seattle. Um, I did a um, <clears throat> refresher program in hypnosis. I was doing some uh, Ericksonian NLP hypnosis, which is the basic stuff I was talking about. Um, I was not really thrilled with the efficacy that I was getting from that hypnosis. I wanted more. So mm -hmm. I did a refresher course in this particular form, and uh, I had learned about it. I had actually had a business at one time called Heart Centered, um, no, Heart to Heart Counseling, and mm -hmm. I wanted to have a heart centered therapy um, advertisement, but I looked up trademark, and it was trademarked in Seattle with heart-centered hypnotherapy, and when I read about it and everything that they did, they had been studying and working on things that I've been working on and studying it on for years. It was a match, mm -hmm. total match. So I did a six-day training course in uh, Fort Lauderdale, blew my mind uh, absolutely to see how effective it was to, to look at, you know, they could actually end, uh, extinguish emotions and feelings that were chronic with people, even uh, trauma. I do a lot of trauma work with this, and and bring in new conclusions and new positive affirmations. So I went to Seattle for five days once a quarter for about four or five year five years to learn to be a master's clinician in this. I've had about thirty or more of these sessions done on me. They've made an amazing change in my life, and it's made an amazing change in my practice. So what do people specifically go, because if it's heart-centered, what do people specifically go for in terms of to what, what do they want to improve upon? Well, the heart-centered really in this case is indicating that the change comes within. It's experiential. And I am ex an experiential uh, psychotherapist anyway. I'm trained in many experiential types of therapies, gestalt therapy and, and so on. Um, so the change happens where there's a shift. There's a visceral, emotional shift that happens inside. Also, they process the, the loss of usually what, what this is about is that people are stuck, mm. right? They can't mm -hmm. get over the hump. Right. So when we find that place where they're stuck, there's emotion there. There's either grieving there's a lot of perhaps frustration or anger, maybe rage. There may be also numbness, shock. And the hippocampus and the amygdala, when there's a shock event that happens when someone is a child or a teenager, something like that, they time date stamp that shock. And when they get triggered, when the, the human or the person, the client is triggered by this, they, it time date stamps it and they just go right to that spot. Mm. 
So they may not say they're three or four years old or six years old when this event happens. They don't have the words that we have as, a, as an adult. It's a fully cognitively functioning verbal adult to say, um, ow, that hurt, no, mm -hmm. or that's wrong, you shouldn't treat me like that, or go away, or whatever it may be, or no, I need a parent to be stronger. Mm -hmm. So when we go back and do, we do, I do two regressions. It's a two-hour session, so we've totally customized it. I know exactly what they want to extinguish. I know exactly what the strong emotional feelings are. We've done the regression. I take them to a, a nice, safe, relaxing place, and um, they anchor that in by bringing their thumb and forefinger together. So that's a visceral anchor for that state of relaxation. And then I strengthen their strong adult, the, the adult that does all the stuff that we like, that makes healthy decisions, that gets us to work every day, that takes care of ourselves, takes care of our children, so on. And then we go back, and the first regression is the very most recent time that they were triggered by whatever these words are. These words are might be, I feel afraid, I feel angry, I feel inadequate, um, I'm unsure of myself, I question my decisions, I'm very frustrated. It, there are many different types, and it's all their words. So we go back, and then maybe it was like yesterday. They were talking to a parent, or they were talking to their boss, you know, some of the examples I've given. It might have been it was six months ago, but wherever they'll go back. We'll process that event, and then I will empower them. After they, they, proce they process that event, they get the emotions out. I help them to feel, become empowered, help them to talk about it, to say what it feels like emotionally through their conversation. And then also, where do you feel it inside your body? Mm. Do you feel it in your heart? Do you feel tension, a pressure in your throat? Is your throat constricted? Is there not there in your stomach? People process emotions in different parts of their body, so we go viscerally inside and do that as well. And then um, once we've processed and I help them become empowered, I will also I'll ask them, can I now tap on your forehead? I'm going to count from 1 to 10, and I'm going to take you back in time. And we're going to go all the way back to the very first time that this type of thing ever happened to you. All the way back, and we'll just all go 10, you know, and I'll just say, you're getting younger and younger, smaller and smaller, littler and littler, going back, back to one of the very first times you felt this way, this feeling of frustration, anger, couldn't get your words out, inadequacy, and they'll go there. Do a lot of people find that very easy to go there right away, or is it going to take them some time? Fan or? Fantastic question. Um People who are really super controlled, you know, they really need to be in control of their lives, they may have a little bit more trouble than others. A lot of the success of the hypnotherapist is the rapport that they've developed with their client, with their mm -hmm. client and the client therapist. So sometimes if someone, and people will tell me, I mean, I've been doing this for so long, you know, I'll just say, you know, how do you, because they'll say, I'm not sure I can be hypnotized. It's like, well, unless you're schizoaffective, you, you probably can be, but if you have a lot of control issues, you may fight it or you may resist it a little bit. So let's talk about that. So we'll take, we may need another hour to work on that. Mm. And I, really, truly, the people that have seen me at least a couple of times before they do a two hour hypno get better results because we just simply have developed a better rapport. Right. Well, and also, you know, for people to feel a little more. To where they open up and they can feel more vulnerable <clears throat> around you to open up and be a little bit more exposed, you know, because they probably have this huge, that's why they're there. They've got exactly. this huge wall up. And so how are they going to trust a stranger, quote unquote, you know, to really work? Although they've come to yes. you and they know that you're going to help them, there's still that it's, that barrier, right? That's part of the issue. Exactly. Yeah. You've nailed it. That's part of the issue um, is... Um, that there's uh, defense mechanisms mm -hmm. that are in place. And so, you know, I talk about, I do some, you know, I'll do a little self-disclosure, like I've had 30 of these sessions done on me. <clears throat> um, I have a, a boxing bag and a rubber hose if they get really angry or mm -hmm. really frustrated. And I'm going to tell them, I want you to get this out of your body. Mm -hmm. You can't shock me. <laughs> I've been doing this for over, you know, 22 years. There's nothing you can say or do that will shock me, believe me. Mm -hmm. No, not everybody might believe me. But as they become more comfortable 
with the idea, and they're paying me. So the idea is also the more you allow yourself the permission, the more you give yourself the permission to really process these feelings as they come up for you, and I'm highly trained, and I won't let you go anywhere that you can't get out of. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They are remembering it. They're talking to me. It's a light trance state. They are not, they're, not, they're going to remember it. They're not going to be so, it's not a, a, a sleep type of hypnotherapy. And it's not a pain. It's not like dental surgery where dentists will put, put people in such a deep trance right. that they can actually do some sort of dental surgery on it. <clears throat> but um, the, um, so the more they can allow themselves to really process it, and what happens is it's an amazing thing. The conscious waters, I call them the conscious waters, are parted just enough so that they can go deeper and find that space. I mean, I've had people go back to in the womb. Wow. I've had people go back to 18 months. Wow. Primarily, though, people will go back somewhere between the age of four and eight years old. Okay. And the, they will process those feelings. They Sometimes if they're better, and when I say better, hypnotic candidate, no one's really better than another person. But some people are maybe a little bit more trusting, or maybe mm. some people have been hypnotized before, so they have a little bit of experience with it. Um, they may... I had someone recently who went back and literally became that child. Hmm. So I helped her process it. I helped her to become empowered, helped her to speak her truth, mm -hmm. to say what she needed to say that she didn't have the words for when she was that age. And then I helped them, the, her to begin to formally extinguish those feelings that have been triggering her that came up in, during that event. I will bring in perhaps a transitional figure during that period of time. That transitional figure would might be, it's, it's always going to be somebody or something safe. <clears throat> it may be a grandparent, like a, you know, oh, my grand, you know, that's my, that's my granny. Mm -hmm. she, she made cookies and she really loved me. Or it might be a family pet. Someone that was unconditional. You know how we mm -hmm. have unconditional, our pets are unconditional. Mm -hmm. They love us no matter yeah. what. So I'll bring in a transitional figure. If there's none there, we'll create one. And it helps that child. That person has regressed to a child state. It helps that child to feel safe. It helps that child to feel secure. And then I help them um, to express those feelings. And then um, we help the child to really say what they need to say. Sometimes the person may need to, to say, you know, I'm going to... this." This um, feeling of low self-esteem, this insecurity that you laid on me because of, you know, what you said to me or whatever, I'm going to give it back to you. It's not mine. It never did belong to me. Wow, that's powerful. Yes. You know, one of the things that, um, that comes up, especially with uh, obese individuals, people who are overweight, mm -hmm. a lot of times... It's because they're packing on the, you hear these stories all the time. Yes. They're packing on weight because they're covering up some emotional pain that they've experienced in their, in their past as a child. And there was always that one incident trauma that you talk about that occurred in their life. And then that's when they started to put on weight. Now, have you ever experienced any one of these clients or individuals coming to you trying to figure out what that was so that they can be free of it so now that they can start to to lose weight and get on their weight loss journey and finally be successful? Absolutely. Uh, I do it a lot. <clears throat> uh, in fact, I prefer to do that. If they want to do that kind of the heart-centered hypnotherapy, I prefer, they get better results mm -hmm. than if we did a standard just positive affirmation. I will eat better. I'm eating better. And right. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the last person I did that on, I don't know. I haven't followed up, so I don't know how. You know, it's, it takes a little while to lose weight. Sure. But the one before lost ninety pounds. Wow. Wow. And the adena So this is what I mean. We go back to the event, and the event. Sometimes they think, "Well, gosh, is it really traumatic? Is it going to be something I did? You know, I don't remember." Most of the time, it's not. Really? It is something that was traumatic to that child at mm -hmm. that time. And you think about how sensitive children are. Right. 
They absorb everything, Mm -hmm. everything. Absolutely. And at that time, they're formulating their personalities and they're they're connecting their brain synapses. And so they're developing their thought pattern. And I mean, as a parent, you know, I'm very conscious of that and so it's like I have to really watch what I'm saying for my daughter (laughs) you know because I'm very like okay I have to watch what I'm saying to her because as adults you know it's not you know we can take it you know when we're speaking to adults but to a Mm -hmm. child because they're still formulating that thought process and that is and especially being a girl and body image and all that that it's very important as a parent if parents you're out there listening you've got children especially girls you know this is very very important because i know i mean our obesity rate right now 69 percent of our population is either overweight or obese and you got to wonder why people are having such a tremendous struggle and it's every aspect of their lives. It's not just an overeat. Uh, you know, yes, they're overeating and they're not exercising, but why? Right. <clears throat> why? What is the root of the problem mm-hmm. or what was the root of their issue as to why they can't get beyond that food addiction, if you will, or, mm-hmm. or the depression? It's a bar- Well, some of it, yes, it's a barrier. It keeps people at a safe distance from them. Mm-hmm. And a lot of individuals who are overweight or obese, they want a relationship. And they're feeling uh, perhaps they would like to let down some of those barriers, both physiologically and emotionally. And so we do that. Yeah. I mean, it's so it's just so fascinating because, I mean, once... You know, I think people have, because it's so mystic or mystifying and and, uh, people aren't, I think people are getting more, you know, with the internet and more information being out there, I think people are more educated in terms of trying hypnotherapy, especially Mm -hmm. with smoking cessation. Mm -hmm. I know this is huge right now. And Mm -hmm. I think people are becoming more uh, accepting of the process. And I think now uh, with uh, overweight individuals, people who are obese, um, you know, this could definitely, definitely help. And I know that, you know, with the combination of a health and fitness expert working on the the nutrition and the exercise portion, and then you have to bring in the mental state and the emotional and the spiritual aspect of the whole, the whole journey. So talk about um, the programs that you're offering and how people can get in touch with you and, and really um, plug what you have going on so people can get involved and, and take Part, participate in what you have to offer. Okay. Well, my practice, my private practice uh, is in Tampa, and it's called Gwen Hanner uh, Counseling, and it's www.gwenhannercounseling.com, and it, it talks about me, and it, it gives a, uh, a description of what we just talked about. And I have several testimonials on there as well for people to look at. I have a yoga studio. We're in Seminole Heights in Tampa, so we're in central Tampa. We're about 10 or 15 minutes from most places in town, right off of uh, 275 in Hillsborough Avenue. And so I had started the yoga studio. It's called J-A-I-D-E-E Yoga J A I D E E Yoga dot com. Okay. And you can go on there and find the class descriptions and workshop descriptions. Um, what we do is um, we're looking at, uh, I was looking at initially, uh, a place to send my clients as a follow-up to therapy or as an adjunct to therapy because mm-hmm. I've been doing yoga since I was 25. So mm-hmm. I've been doing it for a very, very long time. And um, uh, it helped me to re- uh, end panic disorder when I was 25. It helped me to also quit smoking because I was, and I was doing the self-hypnosis. So um, we have anything from um, stress man- yoga for stress management there to fitness yoga, which would be, um, uh, I think we're calling that particular class um, uh, yoga flow alignment. So it's an okay. alignment-based so that we can prevent injuries. We're also interested in yoga therapy. We've been working with um, doing yoga privates and helping people to find, we have several massage therapists there who will do a yoga therapeutic um, one-on-one session with clients to help them if they have physical injuries, if they have emotional injuries I, I work with, or emotional issues I work with them. I might do something like a hypnotherapy, or and I also could do some gentle or uh, restorative type yoga 
Uh, I do guided imagery. I, I was doing, I'm not doing it now, but I may be doing it again. It's a, re, it's a hypno-restorative yoga. Hmm. So um, guided imagery uh, and then uh, restorative yoga poses, which are what you're done on bolsters. It's done on the floor, so you, anybody can do it. Um, everybody needs that. It's for everybody. Re, it's for relaxation. <laughs> yes, take a drink. <laughs> yes. And um, then I, at the end of that, um, I provide a, a hypnosis. So I'll do a, an induction, and then I'll just... I sometimes I ask them, you know, do y'all have any things you want to, you know, any kind of post hypnotic suggestions you want today? And this is in a group <coughs> setting. Okay, perfect. Sometimes they'll tell me, sometimes they won't. So I'll, I'll just kind of go in and let whatever comes to me. Mm-hmm. Like, it, and so I would do post hypnotic suggestions for weight loss or eating healthy, mm-hmm. exercising, um, increasing self esteem, uh, ending uh, addictive habits. Okay. People loved it when I did it. I got a little burnout on it, so I stopped. I took a break, but um, I'm about ready to get back. That's into good because <laughs> that's the, I know a lot of people would be interested in that. So fantastic. Well, gang, um, you know we're going to put her information uh, on our connected into the website here on healthinforadio.com connected to the pulse that way you'll be able to find Gwen and uh, ask her for more information if you're interested in participating in some of her yoga classes and even maybe um, sessions in hypnotherapy if you've got any issues out there that she could help you with this has just been really uh, motivating and inspirational because it really does open up other opportunities for people to really work on their 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 mental health and as well as their physical and find out things that you know that they haven't if they're not aware of the reason why they're overweight or obese or the you know reasons why they're having stress at work so that was very very good awesome thank so you. we're going to ask you to stay mm-hmm. and okay. um, because we've got what's trending and uh, you know I love going on uh, and finding out what is the latest information and sometimes you know when you're looking for the latest research out there because we really want to stay on top of proper information there's a lot of fads and 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 gimmicks out there and so we want to make sure that we're educating our people and steering you away from a gimmick or a fad something that's going to end up costing you a lot of money and it's not going to give you any results whatsoever so i want to make sure that i'm providing you proper information and the latest studies that come out so today we've got some information uh, a study out about middle-aged adults you know i hate to say it but i i'm kind of in that category now i can't believe it i feel like i am still 21 years old which is a good thing i Mm -hmm. must be doing something right right so when they say middle-aged i'm like i'm one of those people now but uh there's a study out that talks about um heart health and that you know middle-aged adults help their hearts with regular leisure time physical activities and you know we say all the time basically there are guidelines out there that we really do need to follow so american college of sports and medicine have come out with their guidelines in terms of exercise and being fit and it is recommended that an individual get three to five days of cardiovascular activity at least 20 to 60 minutes per session and that is elevating your heart rate to about Um, 60 to 90 percent of your maximum heart rate now if you're listening to this and you don't know what your age predicted maximum heart rate is it's a very simple formula you take 220 minus your age and then that is your age predicted maximum heart rate and then to exercise you want to be between 60 to 90 percent of that that number 220 minus your age your maximum heart rate so you want to try to maintain probably i would say about 75 to 80 percent to maintain that intensity level for about 20 to 60 minutes during a cardio session three to five days a week then it is also recommended that you get in at least two days of 
total body resistance training. And that's going to help keep your metabolism boosted because you're going to increase muscle tissue and that's metabolically active tissue within your body. And so that's just going to keep your metabolism revved over a long period of time. And then the cardio activity is going to help you burn off those extra calories. So if you've done some damage over the weekend, partying and celebrating too much with your friends with, uh, with caloric intake, then you can burn off extra calories to do so. Then you always want to get in flexibility as much as you can. So take a yoga class, make sure you're stretching after every single workout. So you definitely want to include flexibility within your exercise. But with this study out, in terms of helping your heart, which your heart is the most important muscle in your body. If your heart's not beating, nothing else is working. So, uh, you know, getting in leisure time, physical activity. And this, this came out August 9th, 2012. So this is pretty fresh. And it's according to new research in the American Heart Association's journal, Circulation. So in a new study, more than 4,200 participants were in this study, which makes it a pretty good study. The average age is 49. They reported the duration and frequency of their leisure time physical activities, such as brisk walking, vigorous gardening, cycling, sports, housework, and home maintenance. So you guys, if you've got a home project out there, get out there and start painting, start gardening, and that's still going to really uh, help your heart. So just keep moving and that's really going to you know prevent heart disease and really take you out of that high risk category so that is one piece of information today yes there are strict guidelines that we would like to follow in terms of being fit but just for heart health make sure you're out there being physically active then we have um, another study, and I this goes hand in hand. We were talking about body image and self-esteem. There's a study out here that says feeling fat may make you fat. This is what the study suggests. And uh, this came out August 8th, 2012. And this was based on a research done uh, from the Norwegian University of Science and Technology. And, you know, we've got bukus of magazine covers, you know, especially teenage girls are highly influenced with the media out there, um, you know, the Kim Kardashians and the Paris Hiltons and, you know, all these fashion magazines with these bodies all over the place. And, and they've come to realize that girls who are looking at these magazines, they start to feel bad about their own body image. And, you know, we talk about this a lot, about how these images are airbrushed. It's not real. It's not reality when it comes to these images in magazines, but they are connecting that, you know, how when an individual is under a lot of stress, well, then they have the cortisol, which is released the stress hormone, and it goes right to the belly. So they measured waist circumference, and they correlated with the growing waist to looking at these images hmm. with the stress hormone that was released for these teenage girls and made that correlation. Hmm. So it's very, it's interesting uh, in terms, do you have anything mm -hmm. to say about that? Mm -hmm. uh, you probably would find that very interesting. Well, I'm glad they finally did that study. Yeah. To begin with, because we've been talking about that for years, right? Mm -hmm. um, positive affirmations are amazing and they're part of the hypnotic <clears throat> Uh, uh, process for healing, or they're part of the, the process of at using affirmative statements. So uh, if, you ha if you're constantly looking at an image and you're comparing yourself to an image and you're saying, I look awful, I'm fat, well, the mind really starts to, uh, the body, I should say, really starts to assist the mind in cooperating mm. with what you're saying. So this is uh, fascinating because we use this in, in, uh, in the healing part of the hypnotherapy sessions that I do, and in really in all hypnotherapy sessions, and in also standard psychotherapy sessions. So we would use it a positive affirmation, something the opposite of that. So the mind is manifesting what the words are, and yes. then the, it brings it right to the body. And yes. this is a... a amazing study that shows that this is absolutely true yes it's it's creating cortisol it's creating enzymes within the body that are actually uh, creating stress 
and they're creating fat. Yes. I love it. Isn't that great? Yes. We talked about this before, <clears throat> connecting the science with the mm -hmm. metaphysics and the and the thought process and the psychoanalysis, mm -hmm. psychosocial. It's and, no longer woo-woo. It is. No, it's not. I right. know. And it's. Mm -hmm. uh, I love it. That's just fantastic. So I'm so glad that we were able to connect um, your being here today with this study. And then going pure back to pure science here again, um, and, you know, I, I couldn't believe this when I read this study. I couldn't believe that this is the first study of its kind. I just thought that, well, of course, that just makes sense. But really, the, um, this was uh, printed at August 6, 2012. Again, very current. Weight training linked to reduce risk of type 2 diabetes. And, of course, type 2 diabetes is on the rise. And, you know, what's interesting about type 2 diabetes is that it is purely on behavior. And, uh, and the, it's passed down because of the parents' behavior. And uh, so when you look at all people who have diabetes, you've got type 1 and you've got type 2. Type 1 is people are basically born with it. We call it childhood, childhood uh, diabetes. And the difference between the two is that with the type 1 diabetes, they're, they're, the insulin is not secreted by the pancreas. That is why an individual has to inject insulin in order for the glucose to be taken into the molecules to be used for energy. So, uh, But with type 2 diabetes, that is brought on through mainly the con the main connection these days is obesity type 2 and you know with lack of activity the types of foods that are that are eaten so you can and what I find fascinating with the statistics of all the individuals who have diabetes either type 1 or type 2 90% of people who have diabetes is type 2 diabetes well, and also, um, the study I read or heard about a few years ago, it may be different now, 20% of all emergency room uh, admissions have type 2 diabetes. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's very, that's a very good statistic because, you know, we just really, we really need to take a look at the types of activities we're doing, what we're eating, and we've got to get it under control. And so the study is now saying this was done um, by Harvard School of Public Health and University of Southern Denmark. And uh, they are saying that this was the first study of its kind. Basically, they have been looking at cardio or aerobic activity with reducing the risk of type 2 diabetes, but now they've really connected weight training. But it says that it may be able to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes by up to 34%. So again, going back to, yes, physical activities to help the heart, but then also going back to what we stated about the American College of Sports Medicine, you do need to get weight training in. Obviously, there are some health benefits to it in terms of reducing your risk for type 2 diabetes by 34%. So you want to work it head to toe. You want to choose a weight that is um, going to elicit about 12 to 15 reps work yourself up to about three sets and you want to work the major muscles of your body so we're talking biceps triceps chest back abs your quads and your hamstrings and your glutes those are your major muscles so you want to work through the body and if you're not familiar with how to do any of that gang hire yourself a personal trainer you're going to learn a lot about how to work out they will set you on the proper path uh, get involved into a class you can even do yoga exercises power yoga that's also considered you know resistance training and that so you're really going to improve overall so a lot of great stuff today um, you know we're talking about our mental health we're talking about weight training cardio exercise and also you know your body image and how if you're focusing on those images out there the unrealistic images out there that may be causing some stress and that may be uh you know you may be uh, fat because you think you're getting fat so it's very very interesting mm -hmm. Lots of great stuff today, gang. So that's pretty much it. How many times did we say the word relaxing, relax, or relaxation? 
I would like to know. So please, Facebook me. Post it on my Facebook page, Carol Ann Misfit. Let me know. And that's it for today. Thank you for joining me. Be sure to tune in every Tuesday at 1230 Eastern Standard Time at healthinforadio.com where you will definitely have your finger on the pulse with Carol Ann.